please join me in giving a warm Georgia Tech welcome to our guest, Bill George. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you much for the nice introduction. And most important of all, I'm thrilled to be back at Georgia Tech. You know, Robert Frost, in his famous poem, The Death of a Hired Man, uh, he talks about uh, home is a place where you go there, they have to take you in. So when I come back to Georgia Tech, they have to take me in. But it is nice, it feels like coming home. And when I came to Georgia Tech, I was a young 18-year-old, came down here from Michigan, 830 miles away from my hometown. Uh, everyone said, why'd you go to Georgia Tech? I said, it's a great engineering school. I'm going to play tennis. I can play tennis year-round. And they have a lot of great people in Atlanta. Uh, and there was another reason. I wanted to escape myself because I wasn't very happy myself in high school. And I didn't know anyone. I thought I'd get a fresh start. But I, I, had, I, I really learned everything I knew about leadership at Georgia Tech. It really gave me my opportunities. And that's one of the reasons I'm so loyal to the school and the people. Uh, that are in the school today. And the exciting thing for me is to watch how the school has grown. You know, when I came here, we used to say, Georgia Tech's a leading regional technical institution, you know, better than Vanderbilt or Duke. Now, you know, it's right at the top of the U.S. And thanks to Bud Peterson, it's really become a global, uh, really widely recognized global. Everywhere I travel a lot around the world, everywhere you go, Georgia Tech is widely recognized. And the exciting thing to me in the latest U.S. News and World Report uh, I was just checking this out. Georgia Tech has more departments in the top three than any school other than MIT, which also has seven, which uh, I think is a recognition of how the school has grown. And, uh, you know, biomedicine, I met with some students today, it didn't exist. And I think it's amazing how this school has really come into its own in recent years and, and had amazing students. And everywhere I go in industry, everyone is very proud of their Georgia Tech graduates and everyone I meet. So uh, what I want to encourage you today and talk about is think about your leadership and how you can be a leader, how you can be an innovative leader in whatever field you choose to go into, business, industry, academia, whatever you choose to do, how you can be a true leader. Because one of the great things about Georgia Tech is people step up to leadership in so many ways. And that's what's been uh, very, very pleasing to me. You may say, look, I have a technical background. That's not what I plan to do. You will be called, I can assure you, into leadership roles. And I want to encourage you to step up and develop yourself in that way. Because the reason when I left Medtronic, I decided not just to focus on medical technology, leave that to the people that are still there, because I knew I'd be soon be obsolete, but really talk about how can you have impact? How can you have the greatest impact in your life? And when you're leading an organization of very creative people, you can have staggering impact way beyond anything you think. So I want to encourage and inspire you to think about how you're going to lead and how, what's the purpose of your leading? What do you really want to do to make a difference in the world? And how are you going to have that impact? You may not even see it today. It may not be in front of you. But I can almost guarantee you that everyone in this room will have a significant impact. And so I think we are becoming, have the opportunity to be the world's leading institution developing innovation leaders. As I'll say in a minute, there are a lot of innovators out there, thousands. There are not many people that are really good at leading innovation, whether it's entrepreneurs, integrated systems thinkers, and global leaders. And the world you're going into is a tough world, let's be honest. Uh, it used to be things were fairly predictable five to ten years out. People would do strategic plans five to ten years. No one does that anymore because they, they, they have a strategy, but it's quickly obsoleted. And, uh, and today, we live in a very volatile, uncertain world that there's tremendous chaos. You can't predict what's going to happen. Uh, actually, a study was done by the U.S. Military Academy, West Point, back in 2000, kind of looking at the, the next century of what was to come not knowing what's going to happen on September 11th. But we've seen the volatility in the stock market on the board of Goldman Sachs, and we saw the collapse in 2008. So one really can't predict what's going to happen. So as a leader, I think you need to prepare yourself for a world that is unpredictable, not just a static world, not just a world of fixed accounting, fixed systems, fixed numbers. And so to do that today, I think you need to be grounded in your, in your sense of yourself, in your values, but I think you have to have a vision of where you're going. Think of it like you're a sailor, and you're sailing to that point over there. And you know that you're going to have to tack back and forth depending on the winds. You aren't sure how the winds are going to be, and you're going to have to tack on your way. But never lose sight of the vision of where you're going. 
So organizations with people that only are flexible and tack back and forth and have leaders uh, never achieve anything because they're just adjusting the stock market, they're adjusting the latest whims, you know, they have problems in China and they now want to pull out of China instead of recognizing it's going to be the world's most important market, like Google was forced to do. And so I think you have to have a vision of where you want to go. And I think you have to have an in-depth understanding of the world. We funded, helped fund a program here. Many of you have gone on your uh, International Scholars Program. And I want to encourage everyone in the room to do that. But you've got to get out and really live in the world. I used to give people at Medtronic a hard time and saying, well, I understand what's going on in China or India. You know, I go there and we have in-depth meetings. I said, yeah, you, what you do is you stay, you fly in, you go to a nice hotel, you stay in a five-star hotel, you go to a fancy dinner, and you go sit in a, in a, in a, in a class, in a uh, conference room and look at PowerPoint charts and you don't understand anything. Get out and talk to the people. Go out around and see the schools. Go out and try to speak a little of the language. Get to know the people. Go on the back street. See how people live. I remember my son John and I were in Mumbai and you kind of come out of a hotel and you get hit with 75 people that want things from you. You go about two blocks away into the back street and you start to understand what the life is like. I just got back from Egypt and we did that in Cairo. Everyone's scared to be in Cairo, but you start to understand people. And if you don't live among people, you really don't understand how the world operates. And today we live in a global world. Every one of you is going to be called to step up and lead, not as a national leader, but as a global leader. And so I think one has to have that, that understanding. And you also then have to have some clarity about how things really work and what's really important. But today, you have to be like that sailor who's tacking back and forth. I think you have to be very agile, agile, and you have to be flexible, and you have to be resilient. My son is just going through a career change now that kind of was forced by his current situation, previous situation. Hey, he's very resilient. I was going to write him a note and say, Jeff, you know, I really admire you're 40 years old and you're really showing a lot of resilience because you can't plan everything. You have to, you're going to get knocked down. Things aren't always going to go your way, but it doesn't mean it's over. Life is long. And when you get knocked down, you just get back up, dust yourself off. It's like being an athlete. You get knocked down, you get back up, and you adapt to what's going on. So I think the, world, the role of a leader is really changing. And so I want to talk about how leadership is changing. You know, I grew up in a world that was hierarchical. At 22, we were just darn happy to have a job. Today, you, most of you don't want to go work in a hierarchical, bureaucratic organization with kinky and thing. You want to make a difference. A lot of people are very critical of millennials. I'm not. I'm a huge fan of millennials because a lot of you say, look, I don't want to work in some job where I can't make a difference. Yeah, you deserve that opportunity. Some of you gave me the opportunity to start the consumer microwave oven business when I was 27 years old. I was way over my head, but I was able to get through that. I learned so much building a team of people twice my age and twice my salary. And so that's how you really learn, by being thrown into a difficult, challenging situation. And you want to be with an organization that will give you that opportunity, that will let you take on challenging problems and challenging situations. And so and I think we're in a world today which is where it's all about empowerment. Leadership is not about exerting power over other people. It's not that I've got five people or 50 or 500 people working for me and they follow my orders. It's really more about how do you empower people to bring out the best, that you're much more of a coach than you are a boss. And, you know, a great coach knows how to bring out the best in his or her athletes and, and get them to really step up. And sometimes you have to be critical of them. Sometimes you have to say you're not bringing us your best game today. Other times you say you inspire them. And that's what great coaches do. And I think a leader is very much like that today. To do that, I think you want to share with people. I think you've got to be real. Today, everyone in this room can tell when somebody's a phony and when they're not. You may not tell them that, but you know who's authentic and who's not. You have a smell test. And, uh, you know, people used to get away with being phonies. Now you can't fake it to make it. There's a colleague up at Harvard that had a whole theory of you fake it to make it. I, I tell you, if you do it in this world, you won't make it because your colleagues will smell it out and they won't want to work with you, they won't want to, and you won't get anything done. And just because you think you have the power, you won't pull it off. So I think leadership today really is much more about not your self-interest, but really about how do you serve others and a cause. And so think about what is that cause going to be for you? What is that great thing you want to work on? How do you want to make a difference? She mentioned that uh, Medtronic now restores two people per second, two people per second 
to fuller lives. When I went there, it was, took 90 seconds before someone was restored by Medtronic product. I'm really proud of that. I haven't been there for 15 years. The people who subsequently followed me are doing that, but giving the opportunity to really make a difference in the lives of people you serve. So how are you gonna do that? What, how are you gonna make your mark? You may not even see it today. It may come to you at a later point in time in your life, but I want you to keep that in mind that that will come to you and to realize that life is about serving and it's about having a purpose. It's not just about people serving you. It's not just about making a lot of money. We all want to be financially well off, but it's not that, because that can lead you astray faster than anything else. So let me finish this. Uh, but I want to share with the, the four factors that are really driving this. As I said, we live in a global world. Uh, globalization's kind of out politically right now. I can tell you for companies, it is anything but out. Industry, every, every company I know is global. Okay, and they're all trying to figure out how to do a better job globally. I don't know any companies that aren't doing that. So you see this political scene where we're pulling back as national countries, whether it's Brexit or whether it's the United States. But I can tell you, that's not the world of business. And I don't know any business people that support tariffs or support trade wars. Uh, yes, they support intellectual property protection. Yes, they want market access. But I don't know anyone that wants that. I, honestly, I know a lot of CEOs, I know a lot of companies. I haven't met one yet that doesn't want to operate in a global world and figure out how to be the most successful. We're in a great global competition, but it also requires alliances. So globalization is going to be the way of the world in spite of what you read in the newspapers, in spite of what the politicians will tell you. Uh, and that, that too will pass, but globalization era, now it is true, and I will say this, that there have been many dislocations. And just take the United States as an example. We have done a terrible job uh, dealing with those dislocations, when people get laid off, when they lose their jobs, when the industry goes down, uh, when it gets replaced, when you automate or you have to move like Harley Davidson, of all people, the iconic American factory company just moved their production to Thailand. Okay, they had to do it to survive. Uh, people are going to make those, but we've done a terrible job helping people get back into a new role. People are critical of Apple because they don't make iPhones in the United States. Yeah. For every person they have that makes an iPhone outside the United States, they hire five in the United States. I talked to Tim Cook about that. So the jobs are, you know, the jobs are not in that production job of putting the product together. The jobs are in all the software and all the coding and all the technology and all the marketing, everything that goes into it. And no doubt technology is having a huge impact on us. And social media is, uh, it's real. And it is, is a factor. It's probably too strong. We're probably uh, overuse it, but I look at it like a communications tool. You know, people used to sit around in the 60s and watch television for eight hours a day. If you want to do that or you want to be on your iPhone for eight hours a day, you can do that. But it's just a communications tool. It's an opportunity that opens it up so you can be in communication with people all around the world with a push of a button. Uh, and I said, your generation of millennials is going to change everything. And I think it's much for the better. I really do. I'm a huge believer in the millennial generation, this idea that you all have a purpose, you want a purpose, and you're really going to make a difference. And you're going to step up at a much younger age than maybe we were allowed to, maybe the opportunities were there. I'm also a great believer in diversity. I don't have to look around this room and talk about diversity, but any organizations that are, don't celebrate diversity are not going to be successful. If you've got an executive committee of a company or a board of directors with a bunch of white males, American white males sitting around making all the decisions, they will make bad decisions. You need to have very diverse leadership in every organization. Diversity, what do I mean by that? I don't believe in quotas. I believe diversity of national origin, diversity of gender, uh, of race, religion, sexual preference, you name it. I just think diversity leads to much better decisions. You know why? because you have diverse life experiences and people input to decisions and you get much better perspective. If you have people all have had the same life experience, it would be like the people I work with in the Department of Defense in the late 60s that all marched off the cliff together into the Vietnam War without realizing what they're getting into. They all thought alike, they all made assumptions, which turned out all to be false. They were making false assumptions. If they'd had some reverse on the table, they might have realized that wasn't the case. And so I think this is really important. I'll take questions later, by the way. But you might ask, why does leadership matter? In every organization I've studied, which I've been doing the last 15 years since I went to Harvard Business School, leadership makes a difference between success and failure. And the failures I've seen, take Wells Fargo. They created 3.3 million uh, false accounts for customers. 
they fired 5,400 people for doing this. First line people, all of them are like first line tellers, first line people. Does anyone in this room believe that the management wasn't driving those people to do that? They didn't think up an incentive system, they didn't create those systems, that they weren't responsible. Of course they were. And if management didn't know it was gone, they certainly should have. I think they must have known it was gone. You can't have that kind of corruption and not know what's going on. Maybe you can have one person doing it, but not 5,400. And yet the CEO blamed all his first line employees for doing it and not one manager was let go in that period of time until the board intervened. Think about that. That's a failure of leadership from the top, of not being engaged enough with what's going on. And I think the reason is people are so focused on short term and they put their self-interest. Oh, I'll get a big bonus. I'll get ahead. And that's where leadership has really failed. So I did a study, I've done a study of a couple hundred leaders who failed. It's interesting, and this will surprise you, some of us you won't believe this, but not one leader we looked at failed because they weren't smart enough. It's not the smartest person in the room that is the best leader. Okay, maybe that's the best scientist, but not the best leader. And so people did not fail as leaders for lack of IQ. They failed for lack of emotional intelligence. Okay? They lacked a self-awareness. They didn't know who they were. They didn't really have a clear understanding. Everyone thinks they were. I'll tell you, lots of time in my life I've lacked, I've been clueless. I've been lacking self-awareness. Okay? Or they were unable to face reality and admit their mistakes. I remember talking to the former CEO of General Motors. They got a terrific CEO now, Mary Barra. But Rick Wagner was there before they went bankrupt. Three weeks, three weeks before they went bankrupt, we were talking about their situation. I said, what are the greatest challenges you want? He said, the greatest problems you've got are government regulations, all the uh, CAFE standards for greater fuel efficiency, catalytic converters, and currency problems we got, and entry into foreign markets. I said, really? And I said, what about the fact you've gone from 50% of the U.S., 52% of the U.S. market down to 18%? Doesn't that tell you you're making cars no one wants to buy? You know? And yet he was like totally n unable to face that reality and admit that he had led the company, not entirely, his predecessors did too, led him into that situation. They weren't able to face reality. Or they lacked a passion for the company's mission or values. If you're going to work for an organization and you don't believe in what they're doing, I don't care whether it's a defense organization like Lockheed or a consumer organization like Home Depot, if you don't believe, or a healthcare organization like Medtronic, if you don't believe in what they're doing, you should leave. You really should leave. If you don't agree with the values, I worked for Linton Industries, it took me about a year to figure out that the very top management was corrupt. They were cooking the books. They weren't corrupt, they were taking bribes, they were cooking the books, okay? But, you know, I stayed because I could run my division and keep an arm's length for that, but ultimately you have to leave. You can't, you know, if you get involved with organizations where you don't agree with people's values, eventually you're gonna have to make a change because you're not gonna feel good about yourself. You're not gonna feel like you're really growing in this organization. Or, or leaders who lack compassion for the people they serve. Medtronic has caused people to have real health problems by experimental products we have. Do we have compassion for that? You bet we do. Some of you have had quality problems. Do we have compassion? Absolutely. We do everything we can to fix it, correct it, correct the problem, compensate the people, do whatever we can. But if you don't have compassion for the people, have anyone ever flown on United Airlines? They have zero compassion if you're an hour late and you miss your meeting. You know, it's terrible. I was talking to the Delta people today. I love Delta, but anyway. Or do you have empathy? Do you have empathy for the people that work for you? Do you really have empathy if you don't? Everyone has problems, you know? And you have to recognize, are you gonna have empathy for people? And finally, do you have the courage to make the changes that need to be made in the organization? And every time you make a major change, it's like designing a new product, it may fail. That change you make may fail. That's what courage is all about. And if it does, then you pick yourself up and you fix up your failure. You get knocked down and you come back. But think about those qualities. Passion, compassion, empathy, courage. These are all matters of the heart. These are not matters of the IQ. These are not matters that you're intelligent, you're born with. You learn these things through hard experience in life and getting engaged in tough problems and working with real people. That's how you learn it. I once with Thich Nhat Hanh, the famous Buddhist monk, and he said, the longest journey you'll ever take is the 18 inches from your head to your heart. And I really believe that. What he was really saying is if you want to be, a, 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 you want to be a, a, excuse me, I had a couple of charts up here. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I went past it. What I want to say is, 
that 18 inches from your head to your heart is what really determines what kind of leader you are. And if you want to be a great leader, you have to combine the head and the heart. You have to have the critical skills thinking, you have to have the knowledge and understanding that comes with the IQ and developing, and developing your IQ. By the way, emotional intelligence can be developed, but you have to combine that with matters of the heart. And that's what great leaders have. And if you only operate from the head, you're not going to be a great leader. If you only operate from the heart, you won't be a great leader. You have to integrate the two things to be a great leader. And I think the key is this journey. You know, so much of what you do, you know, to get into this school, to get out of this school, uh, to graduate, is an intellectual, it's an I thing. You know, you, you write the paper yourself. Now, you do a lot of collaboration here, but basically, can you make that journey from I to we? Okay, where you really see your role is to be authentic and to serve other people and to make purpose divisions, division decisions, You're not doing things on your own, but having a diverse, forming a diverse team with different intellectual backgrounds, You're working together for a purpose. You align people through mission and values. When you're running a global organization, that's the only thing that align people. Numbers are not going to align them. And it's a question of humility. Uh, can you be humble enough to say, I don't know. I really don't have the answer to that. Let's go find the people that can. And you're going to become more of a coach and a mentor of others. And you mentor peers. You don't have to be older than someone. And, uh, and you empower people to step up and lead. And when there's a problem, if there's a problem, the leader has to take responsibility for the problem. But when there's success, the team always gets the credit. And every good coach knows that. Anyone that's a blamer, how many of you would like to work for a blamer that's looking for every time something goes wrong, instead of taking responsibility, they're the boss, they t instead of taking responsibility, they're looking for somebody to point the finger at. I think it's just exactly the opposite. You've got to give the team the credit when things go well, step up and say, I, I'll take responsibility for that. Uh, and you can hold me accountable. And it's like Howard Schultz said when they had the problem with the, had two African-American men in Philadelphia at Starbucks, and he flew out there and he said, I'm responsible for what happened. He didn't say, you know, somebody in our store, they called the police on those two African-American men's responsible. He said, I'm responsible. This is our organization. Okay, and to me, that's what leaders do, is you have to step in front of those situations and take responsibility. But I think what's missing, as I said, the world's filled with innovators. What we need are more innovation leaders. And these are just some examples of people who really are great innovation leaders. So look at some of these. My friend Ken Frazier, CEO of Merck. I'll talk more about him later. I'll tell you, he's, he's a lawyer by training. Harvard Law School, he, he has no scientific background. He's a great inspire of innovators. Certainly that's what uh, Eric Schmidt, who I know from a board we're on together, has done at Google. Uh, and you look down here at Bob Iger at Disney, how many field do you think about? One of the most creative, innovative organizations in the world, along with Google. He is a great, he's not an innovator, he's a great innovation leader. He knows how to, why if, why if uh, Pixar, when they acquired Pixar, had the 13 or 14 most successful animated films of all time. Because they inspire people like you to do the work and create really <laughs> exciting, innovative things. Uh, the new CEO of Medtronic. He does have a doctorate in electrical engineering, but he's done so much to inspire innovation in Medtronic. Omar, by the way, was born in Bangladesh. When I went to Medtronic, it looked kind of like the Norwegian Lutheran church. You know, it was kind of all white bread. <laughs> and he's a devout Muslim. He goes to Mecca and does the Hajj, you know? And uh, he's an amazing guy, uh, you know? And like I say, he came from Bangladesh and was fortunate enough to get to go to London to school. So to become that innovation leader, you're here learning a lot of knowledge. You go into the workplace, you develop skills, and you develop the critical thinking. All these things are like building blocks, they're essential. But I think becoming an innovation leader is something very different than that. Uh, I think you need to have some of these characteristics to be a we leader, not an I leader. And as I mentioned, the quality of passion, compassion, and courage. And you need to be how to inspire people. And also, how to protect the Mavericks. Some of the best innovators are kind of different kind of people. At Medtronic, our best innovators are serial innovators, but they were a different kind of folks. They didn't play the game the way everyone else did, and HR didn't like them, and they would have liked to get rid of them. They need to be protected, because they did our most creative thing, because they're willing to take the big risk. And it led to a lot of breakthroughs in heart failure and spine therapy and treatment of people with very advanced neurological disease. We had a wonderful treatment for Parkinson's disease. We hadn't had the innovator running that program. We never would have gotten there because I thought it was a very long shot it would ever be approved. And they know how to collaborate 
and they look at the long term. So do you have some of those qualities? And so I want to ask you a question. And I want to talk more about this. How are you going to discover your true north, which I'll talk more about? How are you going to develop yourself as an innovation leader? You only do it through experience. You don't do it by sitting in a classroom. And uh, we'll talk about your sweet spot and ultimately what's going to be your purpose, your leadership. This comes right out of my book. Uh, but true north is basically, that's who you are at your essence. And it's that, that inner self of who you are. What do you believe? What are your values? Who are you? And what's really important in your life? And when you get grounded in that, then you're not as susceptible to all the temptations, you will, all the things out there, all the siren songs trying to draw you in a different direction. And you know what, what, what motivates you. And then you can do what you want to do and not what somebody else wants you to do. Far too many students at Harvard Business School get drawn into finance when they have very low interest in finance just because of the status and the money. And then they say, why did I ever do this for 10 years of my life? You know, I could have been something what I really wanted to do. So think, if, you're, if you love finance, go into finance. That's great. But only do what you love because you're going to be the most successful. So True North, the, temp, the problem is most of you could tell me, if I asked you to write it down, what your True North is. If you spend about half an hour thinking about it, talk to someone you care about, really thinking about it. The problem is we get pulled off track. We get seduced and we get pressured off track. And I've seen, I just wrote an article a couple weeks ago about four great leaders, but how many other leaders have been pulled off track. I had one come out today in Fortune about how some really great leaders have been pulled off course by money, fame, and power. Jeff Immel to GE destroyed 80% of the value of General Electric. You know, he had every opportunity. Uh, how could that be? It was the world's most iconic company 15 years ago and now it doesn't exist anymore. The GE we knew will never exist again, okay? I mentioned John Stump, Wells Fargo, uh, Rajat Gupta, McKinsey. How can you get pulled off track so much that you're worth $130 million and you know, you're willing to sell, you know, sell people down the river with inside information and wind up spending two years in jail? He was a great leader, I admired him, but he got pulled off by seductions. So I think you need to be grounded in your life story, who you are. I mentioned Ken Frazier earlier. Ken was born in South Carolina, now the, uh, excuse me, born in Philadelphia, but his grandfather was a slave. If you do the math, you'll figure out his grandfather was born before 1863. Ken is about 63 years old. <coughs> a stunning story. His father was, his grandfather got his father out of South Carolina to Philadelphia. His father never rose above the level of janitor. He said, my father, I admire him more than any person I've met in my life. He read two newspapers a day. He taught himself English. He never went beyond first grade, first grade education. And when Ken was 12, he called Ken and his sister into the room and said, uh, your mother died this morning. Today is a good day because she's now at peace. And Ken said, that is faith in action. Ken went on to get a scholarship at Penn State. He got a scholarship to go to Harvard Law School. And he's a man of enormous courage. And his mission when he went to Merck, he said, we're going to invest in, we're going to invest in diseases like Alzheimer's, <coughs> which we have a very low probability of fixing, of very advanced forms of cancer, and we're going to commit to this. And he got beaten up by the stock market. He said, this company, as long as I'm here, will never spend less than $8 billion a year on research. And he spent a lot more than that because he's so committed to changing people's lives. He said, you know, some of these drugs we invent will be impacting people 30, 50 years from day long after I'm gone. But that's what I think we're all about. And he has restored Merck Science because he's a person that's true to his life story. He knows where he came from. He came from poverty. He came from racial discrimination. I once said to him, I said, Ken, do you ever get discriminated against? And he laughed and he said, of course, all the time. He said, you know what though? If you discriminate against me because of the color of my skin, he said, uh, then I'm just lowering, if I get angry at that, I lower myself to your low. I'm just going to ignore what, what you said and walk right past it because I'm not going to get drawn into that. And when it came to the situation in Charlottesville where the Ku Klux Klan that we used to be afraid of when I was here and white supremacists and neo-Nazis came in and the wrong thing was done, he was the one that stood up and resigned from the president's councils. This is not a political statement. But he showed enormous courage to do that, and 43 CEOs of the largest corporations in America followed him out the door. So, but the important point here is he's living his life story. That's not your life story. 
but you've got to live your life story. And we have difficult crucibles we face. Almost everyone I've met that's 40 years old or older has faced crucible. Normally, the younger than you are. Difficult times growing up, problems in their family, rejection by friends, discrimination, uh, divorce in a family, health problems. There's a lot of things. And we tend to bury those things. And I was with, uh, I had a guy write me after True North first came out. And he said, Bill, 35 years ago, he said, I was flying with my, he's from Uruguay. And he said, I was flying with my rugby team across the Andes Mountains, and our plane crashed into the mountains. And he spent, we said, we spent 72 days in the mountains with no food, no water, and street clothes like we have on right now. And not everyone survived. 126 people were on that airplane. 61 survived the crash. 16 walked out 72 days later. And he said, you know, you realize in that situation what really matters. What really matters in life. And he said, when you're faced with a difficult crucible, he said, there's three ways to deal with it. One thing you can do is lead an angry life looking backwards, saying, you know, you didn't face that. And why did I have to go through that? He said, that will never get you anywhere because you carry that anger forward. It's not the other person. You visit that in other people. So the second way, which most people take, he said, which I did for 35 years. I never mentioned this. This is a famous story of, of Alive where the crash in the Andes took place. He said, you cut yourself off in the neck and you don't share anything. You just stuff it down there and eventually it comes out. Whatever it is, it will come out. And he said, that's what happened to me. He said, there's a third way. He says, think of your life like an oyster pearl. Uh, and a pearl is formed from an oyster shell that's facing with the waves coming over it and they're washing over it and there's salt water and there's sand. It's very grating and irritating to that oyster and it forms a substance called nacre, which is mother of pearl. That's not the pearl itself, but inside that is a beautiful pearl. So if you face difficult times in your life, the kind of things I mentioned, think where is that, what do you get from that experience, that pearl in your life? Maybe you had a life-threatening illness and you want to take on health care to change people's lives. I've known a lot of people like that. Maybe you went through discrimination and you want to do whatever you can to stop discrimination in the environment you're in. Maybe you went through poverty and maybe you want to help other people not experience what you experienced, whatever it is. And maybe you came from a family where everything was perfect, but it wasn't because you felt rejected uh, by your best friend. Whatever it is, I think it's really important that we step up to that. So I can't say I had any dramatic crucibles like Ken Frazier or, uh, or Pedro Algarta did, but I can say that I came here, as I meant, started to tell you that in part, uh, my father, was, I'm a son, only son of, uh, of older parents, and my father wanted me to make up for his failures. Now, I thought he was a successful consultant, but he said, son, I'd like for you to make up for my, fa make up for my failures. I'd like for you to be head of a, co of, of a company. And I, nine, ten-year-old boy, he's even naming companies. He said, there's a great company in Atlanta, Georgia, that held their stocks since 1937 called the Coca-Cola Company. You could be head of that company someday, son. Or there's another one in Cincinnati called Procter & Gamble, or a new little computer company out on the East Coast. And uh, uh, of course, I didn't know what these companies were. I drank Coca-Cola, but I didn't know what the companies were. But it was a pretty heavy trip for a little kid. And, uh, but somehow I got this, I, I pushed my father away because that's in the back of my mind. So uh, I never was, I joined a lot of organizations in high school. I was never selected to lead anything. And uh, I can tell you that, uh, that uh, I finally ran for president of the senior class in high school. And when the votes came in, I lost from a margin of two to one because I really didn't know what it was all about. So I came to Georgia Tech, as I said, to escape myself because I wasn't happy myself. I loved Georgia Tech, but I came here in part because I didn't want to go to Michigan where there are a lot of people I knew, all my friends are going there. You know what, you can, you can change where you are. Wherever you go, there you are. So you can change from here to here, but you take yourself with me. So I joined a lot of organizations at Georgia Tech, ran for office six more times, lost all six. <laughs> and then some seniors took me aside and said, Bill, no one's ever going to want to work with you, much less be led by you because you're moving so fast to get ahead that you don't really take time for other people. And that was like a blow to the solar plexus because you know what, they were right. Uh, I was, I was like I was building a resume for success, but I really wasn't taking time for other people. And I spent six months really thinking about that, getting feedback from people that had rejected me, and it was the best learning experience of my life. 
But, uh, you know, I eventually went through a couple of hardships. Uh, my mother died when I was 24, right after I got out of business school. And uh, I was very, very close to my mother, never close to my father. And uh, I eventually, my mother was really a source of my values. And so I think of her like sitting on my shoulder every day because, uh, you know, it's interesting. Here we are 50, more than 50 years later, and I'm still thinking about her as the source of my values. Uh, and I recovered from her death, fell in love. To get, I was working in Washington with a woman that lived a couple blocks away in Washington, who come from Macon, Georgia, fell in love, got engaged to be married. And uh, we had planned, made all the plans for the wedding in Macon. Uh, all the groomsmen, everything lined up, parties and everything. And she started having headaches and uh, we didn't think too much about it. She went back to Macon to make final plans for the wedding. And three weeks to the day, before the wedding, on a Sunday morning, her parents called to say she died that morning of a malignant brain tumor, a glioblastoma, which we now know is incurable. And I tell you, I was just devastated because in my way of thinking about life, uh, when your parent dies, and some of you have had parents die, as hard as it is, it's still in the natural order of things. When a 25-year-old who's doing great work, working the Appalachian Regional Commission, dies and you love her, and she's gone, you have no, even though I'm a person of faith, there's no way really to explain why. And there are no real answers to that question. In fact, if I hadn't had friends, a lot of them from Georgia Tech that came to her funeral, really helped pull me out of that period. And then, I can't explain this to you, I'm not gonna give you a religious or metaphysical explanation, but a few months later, uh, I met a woman named Penny, and we fell in love, and we just having our 50th wedding anniversary this summer, and so sometimes in life, one door closes and another one opens. And it's hard to see, it's hard to under explain why, but you have to be open when that door opens. And uh, I feel very blessed by that, uh, by both tragedy and joy. As Kali O'Brien said, the, the deeper sorrow carves into your bosom, the more joy you can contain. And I think that's really true. We face difficult times. But I was still had this idea, I'm gonna be CEO of a major company. And I went to work for Honeywell thinking I'm going to be the CEO. I was president of uh, Honeywell Europe at age 38. Came back from Europe. And I got thrown into a series of turnarounds. And I had to run this business and then that business and this business. And uh, finally one day I'm driving home. And, uh, you know, I think I'm very, anyone looked, I thought I was successful. My wife had a good job. We had two sons, one in high school, one in junior high. We had a lot of friends. Things were going well. And I looked myself in the rearview mirror and what I saw was a miserable person, me. Now, you might ask, how can you be miserable when you seem to have everything going for you? I was miserable because I was losing it. I was grabbing for that brass ring to try and be CEO of Honeywell, playing the corporate game, changing how I dress, wearing cufflinks, which I don't wear, acting different than I was, trying to be the man. And if you've ever been in the days, you've seen some of this behavior. And everyone else could see how ugly it was. You know, I couldn't see it. And I said, boy, I can, I can do, I can solve any problem. But you know, I was very unhappy. And so I went home and told my wife this, and Penny said, you know, Bill, I've been trying to tell you for a year, you just refuse to listen. <laughs> See, it's the person that's closest to you that sees you as you really are. And so uh, I went to my men's group the next morning, which meets every morning. Uh, I wasn't there this morning, I was here. But, uh, and they said, you know, we've seen these changes, and you know, you've turned Medtronic down for a job three times, why'd you turn him down? And I said, you know, honestly, I thought I was going to be head of a big company. Medtronic was a mid-sized company in those days. So I want you to give it a shot. And so I went and thought about it, finally got up my courage, called the CEO back, asked if the job I had turned down four months before was still open, and it turned out it was. And one of the greatest blessings in my life, when I walked through the door of Medtronic, uh, five months later, as the new president, chief operating officer, not, not CEO. And the reason was, is because I went to an organization where it had values and a mission that I could really align with People at Honeywell were fine, they're good people. But this is a business I really cared about. And I was, really felt I could make a difference. And I actually found in a smaller organization we could make a lot bigger difference. Now Medtronic's not such a small organization. But we could really make a big difference in the lives of people we serve. And so sometimes you're not in the right place in life. And as I say, that door at Honeywell had to close before I could open the door to Medtronic. But it led to all the good things. You know, I had the, the best 13 years of my career there. And then everything has happened since then, I think came out of the insights and the opportunity to lead great people. 
So uh, that's my story, and I just wanted to share that with you because it shows that, you know, we can all face difficult times, but we need to stay grounded in who we are. And I was losing my bearings. And, you know, uh, Steve Jobs said some wonderful things in Stanford, you can get it online. But he said, you can't connect the dots of your life looking forward. You can't see what's going to come in your life. You can't tell what's going to happen. You don't know. But you must connect them looking back. See, I didn't do that. I didn't connect the same thing that was driving me to be president of the senior class or get elected at Georgia Tech was external validation. It wasn't about who I was or how I was helping other people. It's all about me. Okay? It was the same thing that was driving me to be CEO of Honeywell, being CEO of this big company. Okay? And also, I'd fall in this trap. You know, I wasn't living someone else's life, but I was trying to carry out my father's mandate. Even though I rejected it, I still subliminally was doing it. And I think he also said, don't let the noise of other people's opinions drown out your inner voice. Your inner voice knows what's right for you. Don't let everyone say, hey, you got to do this. this. You should see people following the herd at Harvard Business School. We all got to go into, we got to go work for a hedge fund. We got to go work for private equity. Well, for some of them, that's a good thing to do. For many of them, it's not. But they get drawn up with that, listening to other people's opinions. And I think most important thing he said was have the courage to follow your heart and your intuition. That's the most important thing you can do. So I've got a lot of other stuff I wanted to share with you, but I think I'm going to stop there and throw it open for questions so we can have a chance to have some dialogue. And, uh, and so let me just stop, and then I'll, I'll wrap up uh, at the very end. So uh, let's see if we can take some questions here from whomever would like to ask. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, just to remind you, this session is recorded, so please just wait until one of the two mics reaches you. So now we'll open the floor up for questions. Thank you. Tell me your name, too, and where you're from. Hey, uh, my name is Jackson. I'm from uh, China, original. So uh, first of all, thank you so much for your awesome session on leadership. Um, so one question I have is, you know, you taught us a great lesson about leadership, but as college students, uh, what are some actionable items, such as, you know, day-to-day -day item that we can do in order to kind of draw us towards that path? Great question. Really good question. I think, you know, it's gaining self-awareness by engaging with you know, organizations here where, and people and taking on small leadership roles to prepare you for larger ones. And so I think there's two things you need to do. All, everyone in the room should have a practice. Every CEO, every corporate executive should have these two practices. One is we get so caught up in this thing, and I'm the worst culprit, my wife will tell you, you know, uh, that I think we need to pull back and take 20 minutes every day to reflect for some form of introspective practice. I've been a meditator for 42 years now, so I take time to meditate. I meditate in the plane coming down here. I may do it again on the way back home tonight. But take time, maybe it's prayer, maybe it's taking a long walk, maybe it's going for a jog. Something where you're separating the immediate from the important, so you're not, you know what's really important. You're not working off a task list in your life, but you're thinking, am I doing today what I really want to do? Did I show up today the really way I wanted to be? So you reflect a little bit, and I think we all need to do that at all stages of our life and career. The second thing is seeking honest feedback. The hardest thing for me to do is to see how you are responding to me. I watch your faces, I've tried to learn to do that. It's the hardest thing we have to do is see ourselves as others see us. We know how we want to be seen, but we don't know how we're being seen by other people. And so have people around you you're close to that get honest feedback. And have a support group of close friends. I've got the men's group I mentioned uh, this morning. I also have a couples group. But somebody who's going to tell it like it is, you know, that's not going to try to tell you how great you are. And as you go into the business world and you're successful, you're going to have people around you that want to nice up to you and make you feel good, and that's not going to help. So develop these practices, getting really honest feedback from people. So you have an odd, you know, I feel like we're not hitting it off now. Can you tell me what's going on? Am I doing something that's turning you off? And get that honest feedback, like those people at Georgia Tech gave me so many years ago. So those are the practices I just get started. Yes, thank you for the question, Jackson. Thanks so much for these great insights. Um, Susan Davis, uh, Georgia Tech graduate many years ago. Um, how do you, s there's a big push for everybody to be an entrepreneur these days. Yeah. How does what you're talking about relate to that? 
uh, a lot of the things you've talked about were well I think that the innovation leaders are entrepreneurs I mean entrepreneurs are innovation leaders that's what they do but don't let it be don't be like Travis Kalanick at Uber he had a fabulous app the Uber app is great I use it all the time it's fantastic but he started things all about himself and he created a very abusive environment even Elon Musk may be the greatest innovator of our lifetime but he's, there's no reason for abusing people. There's no reason he's lost his 50 top leaders around him. You know, have a little heart, you know. And so you know, I think being an entrepreneur is great. And even if you're with a big company, try to be an entrepreneur. Try to do innovative, creative things inside the company. Push the boundaries. Push the limits. Don't play the game by the rules, but always be pushing the, the limits on things. And that, this country is made up of that, and we have the opportunity for freedom to do that and really explore and pay more than just about any place on earth, except maybe Israel, where you have the opportunity to do really creative, innovative things. And so I think that's what's made our country great. And you know, Medtronic started with two people back in 1949 and in 1960 where the company was essentially bankrupt and the founder, his brother-in-law was founded with him and had died and he, you know, he got some venture capital funding and put it to work, and now Medtronic's got a $120 billion market cap, so it's done rather well, you know, and has 85,000 employees. So little companies grow up to big, big companies, and that's, that's, the, that's what America's all about, is providing those opportunities. Sears Roebuck is bankrupt, okay, and Home Depot is doing great, so is Target, you know, and so is Walmart, so, and so is Amazon. So that's, these companies, that's what it's all about. So I encourage you all, to have entrepreneurial experiences, even if it's within a larger organization where you're doing really creative things and you're pushing the limits. Do it now. What do you got to lose? You know, you really don't have anything to lose, okay? Don't just get into a little slot and work in your little cubicle and run spreadsheets the whole day. You know, do something where you really can make a difference. You feel like you're, you really have a chance to use your creative juices. So thank you for that, Susan. Come on, guys. Yeah, thank you. Here you go. You got one right here. Give him a Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Karin. Okay, you're up next. Give him the mic. He'll be up. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm Karin. I'm originally from Bangalore in India. Uh -huh. Fourth year ISY as well. And kind of my question was slightly more personal. If I had to tell you to do, to redo your career all over again, what would you do differently? What would I do differently? I probably wouldn't have stayed at Honeywell as long as I did. I think I was too caught up in the big company. And uh, I, I actually within Lytton, I, I should have left earlier, but I had so much fun building the microwave business from like $10 million to $200 million and building our days from 200 to 2000 It was a great learning experience. So I don't really regret that. I regret misjudging the company and the values of the top leaders and their discriminatory tendencies. You know, it was, uh, anyway, I, that, that turned me off, if you want to know the truth, and I put up with it. Um, but I, I think I wouldn't have shot so much for big organizations, but say you can make a difference in a smaller organization. But I sure am glad I went to Medtronic when I did, so I feel blessed I've had that opportunity. Maybe I had to learn some of those lessons. Maybe I had to get rejected or feel like I was doing the wrong thing or lose my way to get pulled back to the grounded place where I should have been all along. So I think sometimes in life, rather than beating up on myself too much for that, sometimes that happens and you learn from that experience what's really important in your life. So thanks for that question. Hey, I'm Alex. Um, I'm a senior here. And I was wondering, um, as we're all looking for jobs in our uh, first full-time positions, in what ways do you see um, new uh, employees at companies uh, display leadership and find a way to work their way up the ladder? Well, I would say when you go to work for a company, two things. First of all, figure out how things work. A lot of people never figure out how things work in an organization, how they come together, what makes a difference, who's making a difference, who are the informal leaders, not the people with the big title, but who are the people that really make things go, and figure out how organizations hum, what makes them succeed and not succeed, and who are the people you want to identify with, you want to maybe be, have mentors or people you can be within that organization. And then burrow down and become really good at something where you can make a difference in that organization. Don't try to change the whole organization. I see a lot of MBAs that want to be, you know, work on a strategic planning group and have a chance to meet with the CEO every two weeks. I'd rather see you go do something to jump into something where you can make a difference. You, yeah, you got a good job, but where you can really have an impact. Uh, I know when I went to the Defense Department, I felt like I was overwhelmed by the bureaucracy. I was 23 years old after I got out of here and I got my MBA. 
And I found something I could really make a difference on. And it led me to a lot of good things. And so I was, became an expert in one narrow area. But also people came to depend on me because it was an important area. And so to find something where you can make a difference. And see if people would give you that opportunity. And then try to align yourself. Maybe with some people who have been there a while. They can both advise you, but also see the qualities you have to give you the opportunity. Because a lot of times you need to have someone who's going to be your sponsor, your mentor, you know, the person going to pick you out and say, okay, Alex, you know, would you take this on? And then when you do it, do it really well. Okay? That's my suggestions. So thanks for the question. Got one over here behind you? Right behind you? My name is Ruo, and also I'm from China. Uh, my question is somewhat unrelated. Uh, uh, I want to ask you about, like, what's your point of view on the current president's policy, like, especially like the economic policy on the trade war? Do you think it will be beneficial to U.S. in the long term, such that it will bring back some of the jobs? And also the second uh, economic policy about like cutting like, a lot of the tax for corporate. Do you think that trickle down uh, idea will still work, considering like the a lot of the jobs now are like automated. You know, do you think eventually like the lower class, the middle class, will still benefit from that tax tax cut? From your point of perspective, how long do you th how long do we have to answer these questions? <laughs> I was going to stay away from politics, but you've drawn me into it, so I've got to give you an honest answer to the question because you can ask an honest question. First of all, it doesn't take an economist to figure out that the two most important economies in the world are going to be the United States and China. You know, and what's the most important thing? If you want to avoid war, you trade with each other. Okay, there used to be a sarcastic statement about, uh, you know why the Japanese haven't bombed Pearl Harbor, uh, and this is in the 80s when it said because they own it. Uh, you know, there's, there's real trade going on, and I think there's nothing better than trade between the United States and China. Go into any Walmart store and tell me how much money you save compared to go to a Macy's by buying goods that are made in China. Okay, so this is not a bad thing. It's a law of comparative advantage. So we should take advantage of that. But we should get China to respect intellectual property. I am a great believer in that. You're probably not surprised because I come from technical companies with a technical background where patents really mattered. And I think it's really important that, that uh, China and the United States respect each other's intellectual property. China is shifting now much more to research and not being a, a copy mentality, but much more research, and we should respect that, and we should negotiate for that. The next thing we should do is, is open up markets. The U.S. are the most open markets in the world. The Chinese market should be equally open to American companies coming in, and that's going to build strength of both companies, because so we're going to bring those companies, like Medtronic brought China. Medtronic's got like a two and a half billion, three billion dollar business in China. We're bringing them a lot of technology, a lot of ideas, a lot of help for Chinese people and Chinese patients. Now, if we do those things, the worst thing you can do is have a trade war. The tariffs are the worst thing. No one benefits. Who do you think gets the money from the tariffs? No one benefits. There are tax on consumers. When you have a tariff, it's a tax on consumers. So say we, as we're threatening, put a 25% tax on imported goods from China. What do you think Walmart's going to do? They're going to raise their prices 25%. They don't have extra margin. All the prices are going to go up. And consumers are on fixed budgets, so they, they can't buy more. They have to buy less. They buy fewer goods at the same price, and so it, no one benefits. All it does is cause problems. It's going to shut American companies like Apple, like General Motors sells one-third more cars in China today than they do in the U.S., okay? Now, China could take over that company and nationalize it and throw General Motors out. What a loss that would be. It's a good thing. Ford doesn't have that benefit. So I think trade is a really good thing, and we should open up trade, and the purpose of the United States never to be to levy tariffs, but to get other people. The worst thing we ever did was pull out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. This was a really good thing for the United States. It worked very much in our benefit. NAFTA has worked very much in the automobile company's benefit. So I'm a great believer in trade alliances and avoiding trade wars and no tariffs, and, but respecting each other's rights. I think that is critical. Uh, I don't think the United States and you know, I won't go out on the liberal side and say the United States has to force China to accept all of its human rights policies. Yes, if there are significant abuses, those should be called out. If they're extreme, like where you have in certain countries, you have virtual genocide, yes, that's got to be. But I don't think we can impose all our values on other countries, but I think we have to work with them for mutual respect. Now, as far as jobs go, 
I'm very, very concerned about jobs, automation. I don't think we should slow automation. I don't think we should slow the advance of technology. I think the jobs are going to be ever higher level jobs. So you <laughs> all need to prepare yourself for a higher level job. I'm not on the page that says that, you know, machines are going to think better than humans. Yes, can you take data? Mayo has 50 million depopulated lives that we've uh, just data sets, patient data sets that we've combined with United Health Group to get really important data. Can we take it down to your mother who needs a particular treatment, or my wife who had breast cancer, uh, so that the chemotherapy therapy doesn't work in 45% of the cases, works in 98% because we use big data to solve small data problems, solve individual, personalized medicine, absolutely. So I think we have to create more jobs and that's why entrepreneurship is where it's, what it's all about. The companies you think are great today will be replaced by others. That is, that's okay. You know, and the companies that stop innovating will wind up like GE, you know, where they're just shrinking. They have to spin off, but that is the natural. But I think we have to be concerned about people. I am a great believer in lifelong learning. Most of you are quite young. We need to be educating ourselves throughout our lifetime. The only thing I do at Harvard Business School is teach executives because we need to have lifelong learning. You should go back to school in the future. Don't think your education ends at 22 or 25 or 27. You need to go back to school when you're 35, 45, 55 because the world changes so fast. You've got to stay up and in touch with what's going on. And so I. I think people have to be retrained. One of the things we've done a terrible job, not everyone should go to Georgia Tech. Some people should go to vocational and technical schools and learn how to program a computer. You don't have to have a degree in computer science from Georgia Tech to know how to program, how to write apps, you know? And so I think we need to really open up more educational opportunities for people that are not at your intellectual level but can learn and can do skills and continue to retrain them. And I feel very passionate about this, that it's really important. And we've done a terrible job, and this is not political, because I think the Obama administration did a terrible job, and the Trump administration is doing a terrible job. We need to continue to retrain for people with the jobs of the future. Why would you train, you're talking about getting a job, why would you train for a job that's going to be obsolete in two years? You want to be thinking about jobs where the real growth is in the future. That's what you want to think about. And so we should be helping everyone to do that. Even your friends, those of you that come from this area, your friends that did get to go to college, they should have an opportunity to do something that can really make a difference. There's a lot of work done with people's hands. We've dishonored those jobs. People that run uh, robots, that run machine tools, who do 3D printing, that are plumbers. And we should not disdain the skill that a carpenter has, you know? I mean, this is an art form. And so I feel very strongly that we've got to elevate these things and not just push everyone through for they're doing what they don't really find out what their passions are when they're 15 and guide them into a course of education where they're fulfilling their passion. Maybe you don't like to work with, maybe you're not good at math. You wouldn't be here if you would. Maybe there are people out there, the friends of yours, they sh maybe they don't, shouldn't go to Georgia Tech. They should go out, learn to do something with their hands. And that should be considered a lower level thing. I know in Germany, Germany's done the best job of any country I know about this. I can tell you, I used to sit, they have these like beer gardens you go to on a Sunday and your grandkids go play in the park and your kids, you sit around a table with a group of machine tool workers out of Siemens. These guys are making, let's say, 50,000 euros a year. They're so proud. They have guaranteed health care, guaranteed pension, five weeks vacation. They are proud. They can do things I could never do. They can run a really complex machine or series of robots. And they can repair, they can maintain those robots in ways I never could. So why is that a considered a lesser profession? You see what I mean? So we need to give everyone those opportunities. And as a nation, we got to better get on with it because our workforce is becoming increasingly obsolete. That's the reality. Our, our, the people that actually do the work. And in every business, if you go into, I mean, I shouldn't have said, I should have said this to you. If you go into business, say you got to work for a Home Depot, get out on the retail floor. That's how I did when we were trying to sell microwave. Figure out what's really going on. If you're in a factory business, get out in the factory, talk to people. I used to go have lunch with factory workers all the time, just to try to understand what the problems were. I, I'm not doing that work. You know, get in the engineering labs, get in the innovators labs, find out what's going on. That's what I meant by figuring out how things work. So sorry to get so passionate. Yes. Bill, uh, this is. Uh we're at the end. You thank are? You. Really? Yeah. Thank you so much. Can I have one last question Yes, here? you can have one last question. This young man, or young man has a question. Um, thanks. Uh, my name is Oliver. I was just kind of wondering about 
what I see as maybe like an apparent tension between when you talk about finding your true north and then also building up your knowledge base. Yeah. And so like I was just thinking about the different stories you told, like all the guys at Harvard Business School who just want to go do private equity or hedge funds. Um, you have very prestigious careers where you're around a lot of really smart people. You're obviously learning a lot. Or like even you with uh, Honeywell, like, you know, getting the experience and learning all that to build up your career so that then you could follow the true north to go yeah. um, to Medtronic. So I'm just kind of wondering where, you know, it, when we're Good in question. college, we're, we're really building up that knowledge base. So I'm yeah. just kind of wondering where where you, if you see that as a tension and kind of how to manage that. It is a tension. You need the knowledge base. That's great. I'm all for that. You need to have the skill set, you need to have the knowledge, you need to know, as I was saying to him, how things work. You need to figure out, you need to do critical thinking, you need to do problem solving. You know, you need to know how to work in multidisciplinary settings, you need to work. These are all skills you're going to get. I just didn't want to, I want to make sure we have the other skills at the same time. And you can do both in parallel. You can take that opportunity to lead. Someone asked you to lead a task team of three people. Jump on it. Or I was hearing today people, and we we're just talking upstairs in the management technology program, working in a small group of four people. Peers, you're not the boss, but you can learn how to work effectively in those kind of settings. And I think then you're really building up your emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is a learned skill. You're not born with courage. You learn it through, you know, bungee jumping off a cliff or something. You know, you learn, out of, you know, but you learn from actually from doing. And I, so I, I encourage you to do both not just be, just do the books. And what I encourage people not to take jobs is where they're going to be put in a, in a back room and they don't come out, of the, they work 100 hours a week, they kind of beat their chest and say how great they are, and they never have a chance to interact with people. So find a situation where you do both. There's nothing wrong with those skills. I'm on the board of investment bank, you know, but I think those are all learning skills, but I think you want to have a chance the engagement and interaction skills. So thank you very much, and I you bless you all. Thank you Thank you. inspiring talk. Okay, this is last thing Albert Schweitzer, a Nobel Peace Prize winner, said, I don't know what your destiny will be, but this much I do know. The only ones you want to be truly happy are those who have sought and found how to serve. There are many ways to serve in life, but if you, if you wind up thinking this world is all about you and they're there to serve you, you're going to have a, a big disappointment. But if you figure out how you can use your skills and abilities, your knowledge, and your personal qualities to serve, I can almost guarantee you, you'll have a very fulfilling life. So thank you.